Um, I'm also aware that sometimes Christmas uh, for people can be a hard season. Uh, can be difficult. Maybe it's the first Christmas without maybe a loved one. And no matter where you're at, um, I hope and I do pray that God's comfort be upon you this Christmas and that you really enjoy um, enjoy it. I want to pray and then uh, we're going to, as we normally do, look into God's word and ask uh, him to help um, us hear from him through his word as we now commit it to him. So let's pray together. Father, uh, thank you for your word. And thank you for our time together to worship you. God, I pray that right now that you would bring a peace upon every person here. That you would cause our hearts to um, zero in and focus um, on your word, your holy inspired written word to us. I pray that you would help me to communicate uh, the truths of this text clearly and in a way that's helpful. And I pray that you would remove from our minds whatever might be uh, competing for our attention right now. Maybe it's something happening later or something that we're anticipating this week. God, just for the next 30 to 35 minutes, I pray that you would speak to us through your word. And so we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to turn with me to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Um, And uh, some of us, as you're turning there, might be wondering, Ephesians, it's Christmas time. Don't we talk about a Christmas text and What does Ephesians have to do with Christmas? Um, It does have something to do with Christmas, as I hope to uh, show you from this text. Um, And as you're opening your Bible now to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, before I read these verses, I would like us as a church family to consider a question together. And that is, when we pray for one another, what do we pray for and why? You know, that question is loaded with an assumption, isn't it? The assumption is that we do pray for one another. And I know that as a church family, we we do. We pray for one another. And maybe there's someone here, I've been a part of Anchor Point for a little while, and you know what, I really don't pray for anybody around here. You know, I I pray for, for me and me only, And it's good to pray for yourself, but we must also remember to pray for one another. So if you were to start to pray for uh, one another in our church family, what would you pray for and why? If you've ever struggled to know beyond like a cliche prayer, Lord, would you bless so-and-so? Help them to have a nice day. I mean, that's, that's fine. But doesn't that kind of get cliche after a while? Kind of like, oh man, I... I'll pray that again, pray that again. Well, Paul in this text, there's a lot of ways to pray for people. Paul in this text, I want us to consider a way to pray for one another this Christmas. And not just this Christmas, but always as a rhythm for our lives together as a church family. So now let me read the text down from starting in verse 15 down to verse 23. Here's what it says. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. In accordance to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, And seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, 
far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So these are the words of the Apostle Paul. And they were written originally to believers who he dearly loves in Ephesus, first century. And Paul, as we've learned, at one point had years ago arrived on the shores of Ephesus for the first time with two friends, Priscilla and Aquila. And they had come to tell Ephesus about the resurrection of Jesus and tell them about the life that he offers them. That by faith in him and him alone, they can have all of their sin forgiven. And so this news was brought to the shores of Ephesus by Paul and Priscilla and Aquila. We also know from what we've been through so far is that he left then for about two years and then returned back to Ephesus and stayed there for about three years. And he invested in the people there. He had plant a church, he proclaimed the gospel, he made disciples, built other believers up, and then he left again. This time it would be for good, or forever. Since he had left, five years has passed since he's writing this now. Since his final departure. And he writes now from Rome which is about 1,400 miles by boat or ship, if you cross along around the boot of um, uh, Italy and then toward Ephesus. Roughly the distance from here to Miami, to put that into perspective. The average speed in the first century by ship was about five miles per hour. So you do the math, he's a hundred, he's a, 280-hour boat ride um, from Ephesus, from the believers that he loves. Imagine being on a plane for that long. Might put things into perspective. So the point is, time and distance have separated Paul and the Ephesians, who he loves. What's more, Paul is in Rome. And he's under house arrest, which simply means he couldn't leave the house that he was assigned to. People could certainly come and see him, but they had to be under the supervision of a Roman guard. And he was under house arrest for two years, couldn't couldn't leave the house. Imagine being quarantined for that long. And somehow, under house arrest, 280-hour boat ride away, Five years removed from the Ephesians, Paul heard something about them. He heard about their faith in Christ and their love toward one another. Take a look at verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, we can take this to mean that five years removed after Paul had left, the Ephesians' faith in Christ had remained strong. They haven't wavered. And their love for one another had remained firm and diligent. And notice their love in particular. It was not shown just toward a chosen select few believers among them, like in their church family. But it says, your love toward all of them. All believers in your church, you love equally. That's amazing when you think about it. When they saw, for example, someone come in to the church in Ephesus, saw a familiar face, greeted people with a smile, it's so great to see you. Or if they saw someone come in for the first time, believer, whoever it was, like, oh, you're here. Let me give you a hug. Well, maybe not a hug, but a warm welcome. 
When they heard of a brother or sister in need, they probably stepped forward. Not waiting for, well, somebody else in our church, they'll meet the need. I'll just, yeah, I'll wait for somebody else to do it. It wasn't them. It was like, they hear, heard of a need and everybody showed up. Oh, we're all doing this? Yeah, we, we love one another. Didn't matter who it was. They probably didn't build one another up and didn't tear one another down. They avoided, I'm sure, biting and devouring one another like the Corinthians were so well known for. They didn't slander, speak ill against anybody grumble or complain. I I would imagine they met regularly together. They were likely those who took to practice Titus 3, 2. Resolve to speak evil of no one. Can you imagine what it would be like to be a part of a church family that spoke evil of no one? I think this was the Ephesians. Their love toward all people, toward one another. They were probably patient and kind. You know, 1 Corinthians 13. Not jealous, boastful, proud, or rude with one another. Didn't demand their own way. They weren't irritable toward one another. They probably had no record of wrong that they kept, no ledger. Here's all of the list over the years that I have against you. And I'm holding it against you. No such thing among the Ephesians. Because they loved one another. Never gave up, never lost faith. Probably always hopeful. Endure through every circumstance. That's what love is, right? And Paul hears this. I'm sure he's just going... This is awesome. I was wondering about my brothers and sisters back in Ephesus as I am chained here to this house in quarantine. Surely the, the Ephesians, as you remember Paul has been writing about all of their blessings that they have from God the Father in Christ. Surely, when they read that, yes, this is true, it had connected with them. I'm sure that they were praising God that He had chosen them in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before God. Like, can you imagine? Like, when you really know that, that changes how you look at people and how you love people. I'm sure they praised God that in love He had predestined them for adoption to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ and that they knew that God had poured his lavish grace upon them and then Jesus as an extension of that grace bought their redemption and the forgiveness of their sin dying for them on the cross and then they're sealed with the Holy Spirit like it's the guarantee of a future inheritance. Like seriously, when you, when you know all of Ephesians, when you know these things, and I mean really know them, not just academically, not just in your head, but down to the very core of who you are, it changes you. It, as it had changed the Ephesians. Because genuine faith in Christ produces genuine love toward one another. So we might ask, well, how's that going for us as as a church? And that's an honest, honest question, and probably each of us have a different answer. But you know, as from my perspective as a pastor here, overall I think it's going pretty well. I really do. Heart is there, the motivations are there to encourage and love. We're not perfect because none of us here are perfect, but we genuinely do, I know this, love one another. We're on the right track. Speaking to his disciples uh, in John 13, Jesus says to his disciples, hey, um, do you want to know how the world is going to really know that you're my disciples? Do you really want to know? And I would imagine the disciples going, yes, please, tell, tell us. You, know what he, you remember what he said? 
They will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. That's the greatest apologetic to our faith. And the Ephesians had it. And they weren't selective about it. Now, under house arrest for two years, away from the Ephesians for five, 1,400 miles away, can you imagine the emotions that flooded Paul when he heard this news? Yes, they're still going strong. I miss them so much. But their faith in Christ is firm and they're loving everybody so well. You know, as a pastor, when I hear how we're loving one another or hear stories, I'm like, just there's nothing better than that. And it's because of this that Paul writes back to them, verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you remembering you in my prayer. So ceaseless thanks in prayer for his church family back in Ephesus because of their faith and their love for one another. And on the flip side, can you imagine the emotions that filled the Ephesians when they read these words for the first time? That Paul is thanking, thankful for them and remembering them. I'm probably, if if I'm one of the Ephesians, I'm going... He's praying for us. He's thankful for us. It's reciprocated, right? Paul's thankful for them. They're thankful for Paul. And they're praying for one another. From a thankful heart. You know, when we pray for one another, thinking even of this, this Christmas season, I hope it includes ceaseless thanks. For one another. Because sometimes I think, isn't our prayer sometimes more about complaints to God about one another or about someone? Like, God, would you just fix my spouse? Take away all my joy. Or fix this person at work. I'm just ruined because of them. No joy in my life. I've got to go to work and meet that person again. Like, change them. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying don't bring your p- complaints to the Lord. But here, here's the deal. What if, what if we flipped it a bit? Or just said, God, I, I'm so thankful for so-and-so. Like, just began to think of things. What are you thankful for? Faith in Christ. Yeah, they don't love perfect, but they're working at it. You know, that kind of thing. Because when we, what we pray for one another forms our attitude toward one another. You know that? It really does. And so we might ask ourselves, well, what does Paul pray then for his, dearly, his dear friends and believers back in Ephesus? Let's look at the next section, verse, beginning in verse 17. Here's what he prays. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Now, three things. So that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And third, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Three things that he prays for the Ephesians. And over all of it, he begins by asking God the Father to give them, notice, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. What is this, that spirit? Now, here's what we do know. We, we know that this is, cannot be a request that they may receive the Holy Spirit a second time or, some, or get some sort of second blessing. Because they had already received the Holy Spirit 
upon their profession of faith in Christ in Acts 18. So they have the Holy Spirit. It's, the Holy Spirit is in them. And in the previous text, Paul has already established that they've already been sealed with the Holy Spirit here in their lives. Who, and the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that they're going to inherit a future inheritance, which we'll talk about in a moment. So you don't lose the Holy Spirit. That's the point. You don't lose your salvation. Christ saved you. The Holy Spirit sealed you. You're His. You're owned by Him, by faith in Christ. What appears to be going on here, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, is that Paul's request to God is that the Holy Spirit may go and press them on further in their understanding of all, of the, all that they have in Christ. That they might grow in the knowledge of who they are and what they've been given. Because, it says, the eyes of their heart had already been opened to see who Christ is and to see all of their blessings in Christ. Paul simply here desires that it just continues In terms of this phrase, the eyes of the heart, what is that? Don't just skip over sections of, oh, the eyes of the heart, I know what that is. Do you? I mean, he says it here. This is not your, your peepers, by the way. It's not the eyes of your head, it's the heart. In biblical usage, the heart is the whole of a person. It comprises the mind as well as the emotions. And so the eyes of the heart is the whole person. Mind, emotions, experiences, everything. He's like, your eyes have already been opened through the light of the gospel when you believed. And Paul's just like, I want them opened more and more and more. Like deer in the headlights all the time. As you continue in your faith in Christ and continue to love one another. And this is all for a purpose. These threefold reasons. So that they may know the hope, the riches, and the immeasurable greatness that they've been given by God the Father in Christ. So, uh, before we unpack these three, the hope, the riches, the immeasurable greatness, I want you to think about Christmas now for a minute. You know, this time of year we celebrate, and we will celebrate here on Christmas Eve and again on Christmas Day, the birth of Christ, who was sent from the Father, who was born as a baby, laid in a manger. When you think about Christmas... Do you realize, do you know that all of these blessings that we've been talking about, the hope, the riches, the immeasurable greatness, all were wrapped in that baby? All of it. This would all be given to us. Hope, riches, immeasurable greatness. Not financial riches, but a future inheritance. We'll see in a moment. All of it was wrapped in this manger when Christ came. And I believe it would be good for us to pray for one another that we know this. This Christmas. That we know the hope to which the Father has called us. This is not some random purposeless hope. Like, cross your fingers, I hope. This is the kind and quality of hope that does not disappoint or put anybody to shame. Paul speaks of this in Romans chapter 5, when he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, so justification is a legal declaration that you are right before God, through faith in Him. You were once a criminal. Christ came, he died for you. 
And now you are no longer a criminal. You are set free. You're justified before him. You're made right. You have peace with God. If you know Christ, do you know that? You have peace with God. Through whom we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice, now here it is, in what? Hope of the glory of God. Not, that, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So there is a biblical Christian hope. And this hope, Paul then defines, does not put anybody to shame. It doesn't embarrass anybody. It's not like, oh, you're crossing your face. You're banking your soul on this hope that's going to happen. You won't be disappointed in the end. Why? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So this hope to which we have been called that Paul's praying that the Ephesians know more and more is a sure hope that doesn't disappoint. And there's a lot of people who need that kind of hope because they're hoping in a lot of things, aren't they? There is a hope that doesn't disappoint and that is Christ and all that he offers the world. The riches of the Father's glorious inheritance I mentioned a number of weeks ago when we were in Ephesians chapter 1, the Old Testament authors consistently taught that God's people are his inheritance. You know God has an inheritance. You know who they are. It's not what, it's a who. It's you. And we, and God is our inheritance. He's our inheritance. And God loves us so much that he's like, I, I want all of this for you. This future inheritance. But what is that exactly? Because Paul says, I want you to know the riches of the Father's glorious inheritance. We have to go to the end of the scriptures to get a picture of it. Revelation chapter 21, for example. It says, look, God's home is now among his people. In Revelation 21, verse 3. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. That's a good thing. Need that. Looking forward to that. That's hope. That's not going to ever disappoint. Verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So you have tears. Your hope in Christ that God has given you is sure. This is going to be reality. This is the inheritance you're going to have. Death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. That's your inheritance if you know Christ. And it is a sure hope that you have and can have. There's one more, Revelation chapter 22, verse 3 to 5. No longer will there be, will there be anything accursed. Can you imagine that? Nothing accursed, no problems, no sin, nothing like that. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will be worshiping him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. Night is a reference to evil. No more evil. And they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. That's hope. That's inheritance. It's coming. And Paul, hearing of the faith that's remained firm among the Ephesian believers and their love toward one another, prays, I really want you to know this. And I'm praying for you every day with thanksgiving 
that you know these truths more and more and more. You pray that way for one another. Because sometimes I think our prayers can just be kind of cliche, right? God, would you bless them today? Help them to have a good day. Or, you know, you know, you know how, how it goes. But here we get, like this Christmas, pray this way for one another. See what happens. Exactly what this inheritance that we've just looked at in Revelation will be like is really beyond our capacity right now to fully imagine or grasp. But when you read it, it's like, huh, that's coming? Now let me, let me go back to Christmas here. That baby, Christ, in that manger, on that first Christmas, born, given from the Father, to us as a gift, would give us all of that one day. It gives us a bigger picture of Christmas. Trajectory of the birth of Christ to the glorification of Christ. We're a part of that. And then third, what, that they may know what is the immeasurable greatness of the Father's power toward them. You can see this. I want you to know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. This is in accordance to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he, this is God the Father, raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. So, he wants them to know, he's praying that they know the immeasurable greatness of the Father's power toward them. What's this immeasurable greatness? Well, first it tells us that God the Father has immeasurable greatness. Great power. So much so that were you to try to put it on a scale, it would bottom out every scale. There's no mathematical equation that can determine it. The power that he has in mind here, this immeasurable power that is given toward the Ephesian believers and toward us, toward us as believers today, is the resurrection of the dead. Your resurrection after your death. This same power, this immeasurable great power of God the Father that raised Christ from the dead is going to raise you from the dead. And if you're the Ephesians, like, Yes, that's true. Death no longer has mastery over me. Do you know that's true of you? If you know Christ, death no longer has mastery of you, over you. When, when, when you die physically, you will resurrect to new life. The same power that raised Christ from the grave will raise and resurrect you from the grave. That's hope. And then future inheritance. That's all coming. And it came, and it was inaugurated in, on that first Christmas, in that baby that was born, Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. This was all part of the plan to give to us. Raised Christ from the dead, will be raised from the dead by this same power, and now Christ is seated at his right hand, in the heavenly places. You see that in the text? In the heavenly places. Well, where is that? Well, Paul explains it. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. So, take no notice of this phrase, far above. Like, that's... Whatever is down here, Christ is way up here. He's far above. What is he far above? All rule, authority, power, and dominion. These are references to demonic forces of evil. Paul will pick up this same language in Ephesians chapter 6, where he says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, powers of this present darkness. Same language here. He's going to pick it up again in Chapter 6, when we get there. So all of the demonic forces of evil that we wrestle against, perspective. 
They're way down here. Well, not even on, the, they're like down there. And Christ is far above all of them and looking at them and saying, you're puny. And guess where you are? You're seated with Christ. Puny. That's what you have in Christ. Do you know this? Are you praying this way for others? That we know this as a church. And above every name, he goes on, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, so Paul lived in an age, period of time, and there were Caesars. The name Caesar, uh, Nero, was in power, powerful dude, like ruled the world. Paul says, here's Nero, he's tiny. Christ, far above him. And he controls the world on one level. In fact, he would later behead Paul three years after he writes this letter. Paul said, it doesn't matter who's ruined. Christ, far above all of them. Do you know that? Do you pray for one another? That that connects Because not only in Paul's age, but in the one to come. That's our age, by the way. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all and in all. Notice to whom the Father gave Christ. You see it in the text? He gave Christ his head over all. To who? The church. That's the believers in Ephesus. That's you and me. He's our head. He's king. And he is over everything. So so here's the thing. What in the world are we afraid of? I mean, honestly, that's an honest question. What are we afraid of? Somebody kills me? I get Christ. Ha! That's a win. I die. I get Christ. That's a win. Everything's a win in Christ. Do you have Him? Do you know who He is? This baby born in a manger. It's not just just a baby. This is Emmanuel God with us who would one day be over all forever. My prayer for us as a church is that this Christmas we would remember that and know that afresh. And that we would continue to be firm in our faith as the Ephesians were and love one another really well by praying for one another with thanksgiving for one another. And pray together for one another that we might know the hope more and more to which God the Father has called us. And we might know this immeasurable, the immeasurable riches riches of the Father's inheritance toward us that's coming to us. And we might know his power toward us in Christ to resurrect us from the dead and give us this inheritance that's coming. That's hope. That's what Christmas is in many ways about. This hope that's been delivered and it will also be delivered. Let's pray that way for one another. Imagine if we did that. 300, like, honestly, if everybody in our church, four campuses, four services, five services, I don't know how many services we have, But if we all prayed this way for 365 days, what do you think would happen? I don't know. But I'd love to find out. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us and your goodness to us. That on that first Christmas, you gave to us the greatest gift of all, 
the gift of your Son, born in our likeness, to be our Redeemer, Savior, and Lord by going to the cross for us. And give us hope. Provide for us measurable great power, life, future inheritance. God, this is all your gift to us in your Son. God, I pray that if there's anybody here who has yet to believe that, maybe they're weighed down with their sin or they can't possibly think that a holy God would love someone like them. But I pray that today, God, you would break through and that you would open their eyes to see your son for who he is and all that he is and that they would believe, put their faith in him for the forgiveness of their sin so that they can have true hope so that they can have a true lasting inheritance and experience the immeasurable greatness of your power toward them. And I pray that we as a church would pray this way for one another, even as you prayed for the Ephesians so long ago. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, today is, uh, as we close our service with couple final songs. We do partake in communion regularly. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, you are free to take communion. Uh, communion is a reminder of the gospel. It's a reminder that Christ's work for you on the cross was enough and is enough to cover all of your sin, all of your shame, everything that you think can, has to separate you from God forever. It doesn't. Christ made it possible. Communion is a reminder to us that Christ's body was broken for you and his blood was shed for you. And he said to his disciples to do this as often as you gather. And so as you partake in communion, maybe individually or with your family, um, I want to encourage you to do that thoughtfully and prayerfully. And then when you're ready, we'll stand together and sing uh, these final two songs. God bless you all. I hope you have a great, great Christmas uh, wherever you'll end up being. God bless.